Welcome to a supplementary video guide for Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War. In this guide, we'll be going over all the aspects of your home castle, which will be available from the start of Chapter 1 onwards. Clicking on the gate of your starting castle takes you directly to the throne room. This is the area where you make your battle preparations for the upcoming chapter. The majority of activities you can perform in your castle revolve around experience, item, and fun allocation. Begin by selecting a unit and going into town with them. Much like how every unit has their own set of inventory and levels, they also each have their own individual wallets. Funds you've acquired while playing the game are not pooled like some might expect in a video game with a large cast of playable characters. The result is a system that asks the player to take greater consideration of their funds and resources. You're still given plenty of options to customize your unit and setups however you want, but those choices will have greater weight because they'll come at a tangible cost. Gold is important because it allows you to repair weapons, staves, and tomes indefinitely at the blacksmith. Generally, the more powerful a weapon, the more expensive it is to repair. It also lets you buy the limited yet ever-increasing collection of weapons from the armory. But most importantly, it expands the options to which units can customize their own inventory. The only way in which you can exchange an item from one unit to another is to have them sell that item in the pawn shop. That item is then available for anyone to buy as long as they can equip it and have enough gold to make the purchase. There are a few ways in which units can amass gold to increase their inventory options. One is by visiting villages before they're destroyed during a chapter. Two is by selling items in your inventory to the pawn shop. In the last video, I went extensively over the thought process of who should initially acquire certain items, since I feel it's a key aspect of the strategy of this game. However, even if you initially acquire an item on a unit that won't really benefit from it, at least they can sell it to the pawn shop and those funds can go towards more relevant purchases in the future. It's just another layer of the potential strategy to consider. Just keep in mind that items sell for one half the value that they're purchased for. The third, and not last, I'll get to that later in the video, way in which you can acquire gold is the arena. Every unit has the opportunity to progress through seven arena battles per chapter. An arena battle battle plays out as if the unit has a 100% infinite accost rate and will only end when one unit loses or the player pushes the B button to withdraw. There is no price of admission for starting an arena battle. Winning one round grants the unit battle experience, refills their hit points, and pays 1,000 gold, with an increase in 500 gold every subsequent battle. You can see in the unit menu how far everyone has progressed in that chapter's arena. Completion of the arena is represented by a star symbol. But even if a unit loses an arena battle, there is very little consequence, honestly. They'll still be alive and be able to participate for the chapter. They'll just be at 1 HP. It's really not that bad. Look at it this way. At least you can use units who lost in the arena to get some extra experience on your healers during the first few turns that they would normally be doing nothing. Now I'll just say that if you simply go through with every unit at the start of the game and put them each through the arena until they complete all seven rounds or lose, that's completely fine. I realize that the methods that many people use to maximize the returns in the castle substantially increase the overall playtime, especially when the number of units in your army can go into the 20s. Some people, understandably, might see this as overly cumbersome and just want to get straight into the grid-based action, so don't feel like you have to exploit the arena because you really don't. I personally see the arena as a highlight of the experience, since it challenges players to flex their macro management muscles. It also provides a showcase of the unit's performance before they make headway into the map, and gives the player a great indication as to what types of enemies they can and can't handle. Now, you don't have to do the entire arena in one sitting. Any castle seized during the chapter can be visited. They contain the same pawn shop and armory with the same pooled inventory and pick up right where you left off in the arena. Maybe you'll find that the few levels and stats your unit gained during the events of the chapter help them edge by that one arena round they just couldn't complete at the start. However, there are major advantages to doing most of your battle prep and arena right at the beginning of the chapter. The most obvious being that more experience from the arena equals more levels equals higher stats for your units. Getting those gains earlier means they will benefit your army earlier. The second being that your options to manipulate the outcome of the arena and bypass most of the uncertainty associated with hit and avoid are vastly expanded at the start of the chapter. As a reminder from the first part of this guide, you can save your data at the beginning of each player phase. Since your turn doesn't officially start until you actually move a unit, 
you're able to save and reload as many times as you want while running errands in the castle. This can be heavily abused to re-roll the outcome of an arena battle that a specific unit might be struggling to get through due to shaky hit and avoid rates. Ideally, the goal is to complete their run so that they can access that pocket of arena experience and gold that's exclusive to them. Tip number one, understanding how to re-roll. The random number generator in this game is actually not random at all. It's completely fixed from the first turn of the game to the last. The only random aspect is the inevitability that no two players will play exactly alike. If you followed a guide or a let's play to a T and parroted their actions turn for turn in the same exact order on your own save file right from the start of the game, the outcome of every battle and every level up would be completely identical. Recognizing that the outcome is not fixed to an action, but to the turn the action takes place, means that if we do the same actions, just in a different order, it will yield different results. For instance, Medir is encountering a bit of a roadblock against this sniper. While his odds of success are decent, they still rely on a heavy dose of luck to get there, which he unfortunately just falls short of. However, if we saved before this undesired outcome, we can reload the turn to progress a different unit through a round of the arena one that will have a much more assured chance of success. We're now on a fresh turn with a completely new set of fixed outcomes, an outcome in which Medir may be luckier with his chance of hitting and avoiding. Reloading and altering an action to generate a new set of desired outcomes on another action is called burning RNG or save scumming. On a side note, Units that use bows have a different set of arena gladiators they face from everyone else. This means units that can equip both bows and other weapon types have two sets of arena they can access and exploit. If they get stuck on one set of enemies, they can save scum and take a crack at the other set, further increasing the likelihood of their ability to complete the arena. While this is clearly a powerful tool, just be aware that sometimes the odds of a battle are just not worth save scumming for and you just gotta call it a day for them. While a favorable outcome for this battle is technically possible, you're gonna be spending a lot of time trying to force it to happen. Your opportunities to save scum before starting your first turn are also limited to how many successful rounds of the arena your other units can complete, which leads me to my next tip. Tip number two, conserving roles. When I'm planning the sequence of which units I wanna run through the arena, I generally prioritize units that have the weakest combat potential first, and thus are the least likely to make it to the end. This way, I can utilize other units arena rounds where a positive outcome is almost certain to burn a turn and reset the RNG for rounds of arena where the outcome is uncertain. Tip number three, trading weapons and items. The type of weapon you go into battle with is often the difference between success and failure. Because of how restrictive the trading system is, you might prioritize planning out a way to trade around your best weapons or items so that more of your units can benefit from their power in the arena. It all comes down to money management. For instance, I might put Quan through the arena before Finn, so Finn can use the Steel Lance once Quan is done using it. So now, I sell the Steel Lance to the pawn shop, and Finn purchases the weapon. The price reflects how much of the durability of the weapon is left, and since Quan didn't repair the weapon in the blacksmith before selling it, it's actually quite affordable for Finn in this state. Repairing a weapon before selling it is something you never want to do, or else you're basically going to be paying twice for the same repair. Finn is able to use what's left of the durability of the Steel Lance, and then repair it later when he earns enough gold from his own arena run. Now I realize that tips 2 and 3 are basically contesting pieces of advice saving your best units for last or using the units with the best weapons first. But that's why the arena is so engaging for people like me who love the strategy behind managing resources. Each mindset and consideration has situational merit and provides so many options for how you want to approach this part of the game. Embrace it. Tip number four. This last tip is the most situational, but it's still something you should be aware of. In the middle of an arena battle, you can push B to stop and withdraw. This takes you to a menu where you're able to either continue fighting, give up and leave the battle with your remaining hit points, or equip a different weapon in your inventory mid-battle. There are a few select situations where this could be useful for you. For instance, Ethlyn has the Steel Sword equipped because it's a powerful weapon that's relatively cheap to repair. However, if she gets into a situation where she's at critical health, she can equip the weaker Miracle Sword mid-battle. 
This sword gives her exponentially more evade at low HP, thus greatly increasing her chances to pass this round. There are a few other situations that this mechanic could be useful to you, but I'll leave that up to you to discover for your own. I hinted earlier that there is one last way in which you can amass gold, the give command. Two units that are married to each other can give their supply of gold to their partner. At the start of chapter one, Quan and Ethlin are the only two units who can perform this action. Over time, other units will also wed and gain this ability. You can see who is paired and who is developing feelings for other units in the augury section of the town menu. There's also a specific unit you recruit who can give gold to any unit, regardless of their relationship status. This ability can really help those who aren't able to clear the arena due to not being combat focused and are in extra need of funds to increase their inventory options. So use it wisely. Keep in mind that moving to guard, performing a special action, or giving gold within the castle counts as using a turn of movement and thus will remove the option to save and save scum for the rest of your turn. And that should be everything you need to know to take full advantage of the arena and your castle as a whole. I wanted to get this information out as fast as possible so that viewers of my last guide, who might have been encouraged to yeet into Yugdral for the first time, get all the supplemental information they need to enjoy this unique aspect of the game. I hope you all enjoy your time with this game and allow yourself to be fully encompassed with everything it has to offer. I also want to thank you for joining me in another quest to discover the mysteries of the emblem. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe! And until next time, y'all, stay frothy.